This is the CHGO Cubs podcast. My name is Corey. I am joined as always by Brendan and we are coming to you on Friday, December 15th. Brendan Shohei Otani was introduced as a Los Angeles Dodger, but Jed Hoyer counters. He gets his man, Jorge Alfaro. There it is. The big signing. Nothing like stacking former top 100 prospects together. Keep adding to that prospect core, Corey. We're on our way. The third string depth catcher was, I think, the market everybody was waiting for. Well, that made a difference in 2016 with David Ross. That's true. So just saying, those third string catchers. That's Jed's strategy. Let me just look at the 2016 team. I'm just going to do as much of the same stuff as I can. That team had three catchers. We have three catchers. Keep (laughs) stacking good decisions upon good decisions. I love it. So, hello everyone. Welcome into the Friday edition of the CHGO Cubs podcast. As always, this episode with Brendan and I is not live on this fine Friday afternoon. And of course, it is the off season, so check to make sure things have not happened since we recorded. But we are happy to be here with you and talk about Chicago Cubs baseball. And Brendan, we we joke about Jorge Alfaro. It's a fine move. Depth, you know, pieces at catcher is is always a good idea. Guy that can throw runners out, fine, whatever. But we still await any of the major league holes being filled in this yeah. offseason. And when you and I spoke last week to kind of set the context, if you weren't able to just join Brendan and I last week, we we did an episode that was kind of under the Juan Soto was gone and we were operating under the assumption that so was Otani because that was where when you and I recorded the smoke was leading there was some people saying they were still in but there was a lot that had kind of turned at the time to Dodgers Blue Jays that's it and obviously since then he is indeed a Dodger I don't I don't think I have anything to add that we didn't say last week I remain disappointed that the Cubs didn't get one of the two top stars. But as we sit here today, like my takeaway from everything was he wanted to be a Los Angeles Dodger. And I don't really think there's anything Jed could have done to sway that. I don't want to talk about Shohei Otani ever again. That's it. And let's move on. And I'm asking you to be patient with me today, Corey. I have, I've been thinking a lot about where the Cubs are like the entire day. I've just been thinking, like, how did we get here? What's the future looking like? And I started to snowball. I mean, I literally have been thinking about this team the the entire day. Yeah, so it, it, it remains an odd spot, right? So as you and I sit here and record this, uh, I believe it is pending an agreement on an extension. But by all intents and purposes, Tyler Glass now is also going to be a Los Angeles Dodger. So it's a weird spot because you have to acknowledge like there there isn't a ton of players necessarily off the board. And there's a lot of ways for Jed to spend money, and I think he will, and make this team better, and I think he will. But you start to get to the point where the options come off the board and the paths to really fill all the holes you need to fill become fewer and further between yeah and and the reason i say that is because there's a lot that's still out there potentially cody bellinger just bring him back imanaga the other pitcher from japan it doesn't sound like the cubs are one of the top suitors on yamamoto we can talk about the disappointment in that but that sweepstakes isn't done yet so let's hold but likely not going to happen it doesn't sound that way at least right it but some people will say it didn't sound like Craig Council was going to be the Cubs manager. So tomato, tomato. The the concern that is starting to creep in, though, and again, even though I acknowledge there's plenty of time left, you have to get those guys now. Ibanaga, yeah. Bellinger, if somebody, if Toronto comes in and outbids you grossly for Cody Bellinger, what are you going to do? Yeah. There's well, only a- so many guys that are available that make your team better and fill the holes that you have. And while I acknowledge that they're still out there for this team, the more that pool shrinks, 
the more Jed is going to have to nail the targets he actually has, right? And so that's yeah. a trickier thing to pull off. Put to put you on the spot. Sure. Right now, how many wins do you think this current Cubs roster stands at going into next year? 78, 80, 82? You can give me a range if you like. That's tough. I mean, it is definitely on the spot because there's a lot that goes into so, it. So to give I you— don't, I don't, I don't want to like go into all of it, but like <laughs> I think the too-long-didn't-read version, at least off the top of my head, yeah. is that you haven't supplemented the bullpen, which was a huge problem. So you're still going to have issues there unless guys from the minors or things like that just really step up. But those are unknowns. You've lost Stroman. You currently don't have Bellinger. But like a full season of Morell, yep. a full season of maybe PCA, Canario, Talkman, like that could be good. It could be a mess. I, I don't know. There's a lot that goes into that. A full season of Seiya maybe producing similar to how he yeah. did the last couple months. The The tr trick is the team that finished the year is not the one that started the year in 2023. So even without Stroman and Bellinger, you also still don't have a lot of that garbage that they had at the beginning of 2023. So you're a little better. I, 80 went 80. Okay. Fine. I don't know. That's fair. I mean, I think that's where I would put the team at as well. So let's operate under the 80 ish win scenario they're currently at. You bring back that's Bellinger. Like a lot of volatility. A lot of volatility. Yeah. You bring back Bellinger, right? Add maybe three to four wins to that, ambitiously three to four wins. You no, if we bring him back, I'm going to have to ask for the full seven from his MVP year. <laughs> Sorry. Right. Yeah. That's fair. The, the 2023 version was great, but if they bring him back, I'm going to need I mean, the, full, the full deal. Listen, yeah. if you give him six years, I need seven wins every year. Yeah. That's just how it is. But, but realistically, three to four wins. You sign Ima Naga, add maybe a win or two to that, get some bullpen depth, some other pieces, yada, yada, yada. You're maybe 86 to 88 wins right? Maybe pushing 90 wins. That's still, from projecting a playoff team standpoint, is likely not going to make the front office comfortable. Yeah, That's just a reality of the situation. So I've, I've been thinking a lot about this, and this is where I said, be patient with me. I need you to stay with me on this, because what I'm about to show is a graph that's, it really, it reflects my brain, okay? Because I, I need you to stay with this. There's a lot of weird stuff on this graph, but just please stay with me. I, so, I don't know what this is. So. so can I draw on this? That'd be sick if you could draw on this. I, I can't I do it. You need but like a Steve Kornacki thing. That would be sick. Yeah. That, I can wear some khaki pants with that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what you're looking at here are two distributions, okay? The question I ask is how good are projections in predicting the actual outcome of the team? For example, how good is Pakota at projecting the actual win and loss record? Simultaneously, how accurate is run differential in aligning with the actual record as well? So you're seeing run differential and Pakota modeled here. Okay, stay with me here. Now, the red distribution is how far off a team's actual win loss record is from their projected. And it's about 14 wins that 10 of 30 teams display beyond their projection. That means, for example, if you are projected to be an 87 win team, plus or minus 14 wins is the normal amount of error in that projection. So if you're projected to win 87, that means downwards to 73, upwards to 101 wins, okay? That's a significant degree of error. That's, an, that's an, actually an unacceptable degree of error. No front office should have that much confidence if that is truly the forecast and the model they're using, okay? Now, even if you 100%, 100% accurately project your run differential, the plus or minus of your win total is five wins. That means 10 teams of 30 teams fall away by five wins or losses from their expected run differential. If you 
perfectly project your run differential. So how would the front office operate? You can imagine if you want to have certainty in making the playoffs, you want to cover your worst case scenario. And your worst case scenario is about maybe 14 or so wins. That means if the Cubs were to go into the season by the front office's standards as a 97 win team, the worst case scenario probably in their model is around an 82 to 83 win outcome, which puts you in a coin flip playoff situation. That's where I imagine the front office wants to be. Now, to your earlier point, 80 wins, okay? If you're projected at 80 wins right now, not good enough. If you sign Cody Bellinger, any of these other guys, you get upwards to 88, you're still a worst case scenario away of not making the playoffs. So I imagine from Jed's point of view, because the team is in this situation, let's sustain our resources because even if you go out and get these massive players in addition to you know, Cody Bellinger, et cetera, it still may not be enough. You still might, may not cover your tail end worst case scenario. So you can imagine Jed not going out and spending more money or giving up more prospects because right now the team, Corey, it's not good enough. I think that's what we have to accept. This team, even with these acquisitions that we're hoping to get, it makes the team better, undeniably makes them better, but likely projecting this team it's really not good enough. So if I'm trying to take away like the explain it to me like I'm five years old version of what you just said, what I think you just said is that this front office, and again, acknowledging that they will still improve this team as the offseason goes on, but they're only going to do so in a similar manner that we've seen in the past, which yes. is safe low risk type things, not pushing in major chips because they don't think it's the time to do that yet. Yes, they don't. I imagine because they think in these probabilities, I talked to R and D analysts, this is how they for like this is legitimately how they forecast risk and reward. Like this is it, right? So okay. you look at twenty sixteen as the example. I can see you're kind of shaking your head at me right now, which I get. But you look I'm at twenty shaking my head at you. I'm shaking the, my head at the potential that this is how anyone's operating because like spare me but this is I how they you, operate spare me yeah if you're trying to project the future if you don't have confidence in projecting a playoff situation you have to be conservative from a, from a job security point of view so if you look at 2016 going into the year before they even signed ben zobris they were still around a 95-ish win projection right so there was more incentive to add on that to layer on that because not only did you push yourself away from a coin flip but you actually made it likely, which is a rare situation to be in. That's a situation you find the Dodgers and the Braves in right now. That's why you see these massive ads, this aggressive Tyler Glass now plus extension, giving up prospect capital where the equivalent from the Cubs point of view is too much for Jed to get rid of, right? That's where they're operating at right now. And I imagine they're probably not going to go out and spend over $80 million the rest of this offseason because it's not good enough. It doesn't make sense because you're not covering your tail end of that worst case outcome. That's going to frustrate a lot of people, I think. If you're right. If I'm right, yeah. right? And here's the thing. You know, Pakoda is a, is a fan-based model. Maybe they can get that down, shrink it down to like 12 to 10 well, wins. I, mean, I think even but, if you remove the data models, your point is an easy one to take, right? Like you look at this roster, you look around – at some of the teams around you, and especially the division, right? You can improve in the ways that we've laid out and feel like you have a very legitimate shot to win the division, if not feeling like you're the favorite to win the division. Yeah. So it it would be something that I could see them considering of like, this just isn't the time to push in. Now, before anybody accuses me of justifying that, I, bro, this team has not won a real playoff game in six years. I, yeah. I, I can't wait for that time. Like, I'm tired of waiting for that time. And I'm getting 
there's a lot of time left, and I always say I, I won't judge an off season until it's over, until I see the team that they break camp with and actually try to sell to people, right? Because they're not trying to sell the current team to anyone. They are tr- they're going to sell you on a version of this team in a few months, and we'll see what that looks like. But, man... I, I need a little more like urgency in the we haven't won anything in a long time department and more building for the future, right? That was sort of my issue with even things like Hoskins or trading for Glass now without an extension or even trading for someone like Shane Bieber, right? I need this team to be building a – when you say what, you know you they need the time to be right, how are you going to get there, Brendan? <laughs> How are you going to get there if, like, you sign Reese Hoskins, he goes off for a year at first base, and then he leaves? How do you get to the point where you're ready to push it all in? And we always talk about this, but sometimes the really talented players, and of course with someone like Juan Soto, you'd have to extend him as well. I've talked about that. But they're available when they're available. It, It seems like a simple thing, but, like, the pool of talent available from one offseason or one trade deadline to the other is not the same. And when a guy comes available, that's when he's available. Yeah. The idea, it seemed, was that the Dodgers went down last year to make sure they had the room to pull off this Shohei Otani thing. But like when Freddie Freeman was available, they signed him because they wanted yes. him and he's a great player. Yes. Right? Even though it seems all along their intention was to not fully compete in at least one of those years after they signed that contract. But you know what? That's when Freddie Freeman was available, y'all. So you either get him then or you don't get him at all. Right. So that's that. I don't want to get like angry because the off season isn't over and I don't want that to be misconstrued but you as can like, but hold on there is a there's a balance there you are allowed to be frustrated no I, I was getting there okay yeah. I'm saying I don't want to get too angry because there's off season left and it, it just isn't done and I don't I don't think it is worthwhile to preemptively freak out when tomorrow they could do something of significance right but it's just getting worrisome, Brendan. And I, I do not like, you and I talked about this. What I don't like is you and I have talked a lot about how for a period during Theo's reign, he and the Cubs organization were seen as the front of the league, the top of the league, the trendsetters, the paradigm shifters, whatever you want to call them, right? That stopped toward the end of his tenure. You and I have talked a bunch about how at some point everyone else was trotting out bullpen arms that are throwing 108 miles an hour, and the Cubs are trying (laughs) to make a guy with an 89-mile-an-hour fastball work for the 50th time. Yeah. We've talked about that, but somewhere along the line, you fall behind, and you have to keep pulling yourself back up to the top, right? You do. But my... My anger or disappointment, whatever it is, whatever I'm feeling right now, is centered around that there's so much discussion of the Braves and how smart they've been about locking up talent on incredibly friendly Trading deals. for Sean Murphy, trading for Matt Olson. Yes, being aggressive when the time was right to be aggressive, international signings, just killing them, making those key acquisitions and locking guys up before they have time to think about how Securing bad Securing their bullpen and signings and trades. Yes. You look across the Dodgers doing the things they do with their pipeline and now just just getting ready to go nuts and spend and spend and doing this creative thing with getting around the the money and deferring it and people are talking man i can't wait to see these two teams battle it out the powerhouses of the nl it it is hard for me not to acknowledge or pretend that i don't feel that there's a lot of talk about these juggernauts in the national league and not only it are neither of them the Chicago Cubs, brother? They're not close to those right. organizations right. right now. At this at this moment, they have an excellent farm system. I think in one of those rankings, they were just ranked number two in the entire league behind the Orioles. Like they have made progress. They are a good organization. But at this moment, there's two teams in their own league that are seen as just the absolute class 
and it isn't the Cubs, and they're not close to those two teams. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad you, I'm glad you brought up the Freddie Freeman situation, how the Braves have built their team. Of course, you want the Cubs to be those teams doing that. I, I appreciate that you brought those acquisitions up because it contrasts how the Cubs have operated, and in this case, it has hurt them. I think the the key phrase of this offseason will be stacking good decisions upon good decisions. Jed Hoyers has said that. Craig Council has said that. But unfortunately, over the last three years, it hasn't been stacking good decisions. For example, when the Cubs were bad, they had a unique time to develop players, to bring in guys who are risky, but perhaps could be contributors for their future competitive team. So unfortunately, I'll read this off. They've given 4,000, almost 4,700 plate appearances to Rafi Ortega, Schwindel, Bodie, Hayward, Rivas, Duffy, Mancini, Alcantara, Higgins, Madrigal, Framo Reyes, Eric Soger, Jonathan VR. Almost 5,000 plate appearances, 1.8 war in the last three seasons. So there's two ways to think about what this, a, right? What a, what a list. Right. And there's two ways to think about this. One, wow, that's a lot of negative value. But two, what a wasted opportunity, yeah. right? And you, then you look across the league at the Rays, Randy or Rosarena. You look at the recent defending World Series champions with getting real five guys. You look at the Garcia. Dodgers. Yeah, Garcia. Mm-hmm. You look at the Dodgers, how they built their team, stacking up depth guys like Chris Taylor, extending those types of guys. The Cubs Max. haven't. Yeah, Max. The Cubs have not successfully done that. So when I talk about their, this 80 win team right now, I understand why they're operating like this. And if there were a different front office coming in and behaving the same way this front office is currently behaving, I may be fine with that. But where, where my angst lies is that the front office that is now operating is the same one that have made decisions that have gotten them to this point. And to bring this kind of, before we do this ad break here, to bring this back to the whole projection discussion, how projections work, especially Zips, is almost like weighing the last three seasons, how they've progressed or declined, averaging it out, finding a historical comparison, and giving a projection by the next season. Part of this front office that we have to project that I think about, that you just mentioned, was they really missed on the late 2010s. Jed Hoyer was not the president, granted, but he was instrumental in that front office. That is a miss you have to consider going into the future. Simultaneously, he was also leading the charge on these massive 5,000 plate appearance samples, not training for Matt Olson, um, trading you Darvish, granted COVID and budget restrictions, I get that, not the greatest time, but the decision was made, let's go for teenagers, not go and get back major league value. And that's led to this context of, where they're at. And if I'm going to seriously consider how players are projected by zips, by all these other models, you can apply the same logic. If there is a precedence for the front office making poor moves and finding themselves in the position where they are now because of those poor moves, what makes me think that will not happen in the future? What blind spots are occurring? And this is separate from the really quality scouting amateur scouting, player development over the last three years, but you have to consider the full picture like we consider Cody Bellinger. Cody Bellinger is not going to make his contract because he has some pretty bad years as a result. Yeah, so, and just to, yeah, again, like sort of try to summarize or make sure I'm understanding, when you're reading off that list, like obviously some of those years were like deliberately not competitive. So just throwing that out there, right? Because like before somebody says, oh, the 2021 team wasn't serious. Like, yeah, we know. But but I think your point is outside of Patrick Wisdom, like none right. of that time ha- was util- used productively. You yes. didn't find anything in that time. And even Patrick Wisdom, half of our YouTube chat hates. <laughs> so uh, however you feel about Patrick Wisdom. Yeah. But I think it's and – it, and it even goes back to like the decision not to – put more effort into Morrell having a position last year. Yeah. There, there's just time that's been wasted on certain things. And you look across at some of the guys that they've signed or given playing to, and you do have to ask yourself, like, man, wouldn't we have been better suited, even if it didn't help us win necessarily immediately, wouldn't we have been better suited 
to learn something about or develop somebody in instead of giving that time to Andrelton Simmons and Jonathan VR. Yeah. Instead of noticing that Jonathan VR was horridly out of shape, you could have found a, a younger guy or a different guy you took and got off of the Rule 5 or waivers or whatever. It's just a lot of people that have cycled in and out with very little to show for it. Not that – it's only been a couple of years. It's not like this was 10 years ago. So – that is indeed what you were highlighting. Yeah, okay. it's. I just want it, to make sure I'm understanding it correctly. Of course, 2021 is is a, a non-competitive, intentional, soft tank year. But those are valuable at bats. And Jed Hoyer said at the end of 2021 that Frank Schwindel was going to be a big part of 2022. Mm -hmm. And so he he did miss on that right. when you give at bats to certain players or anticipate giving those at bats away by default, you close off other options, right? And those closing off of other options, who knows what those could have been that translate to value in 2024, either in the form of trades or in the form of on-field development, we won't know. And that's, that's where some of the frustration lands. And the reality is most front offices make mistakes like that. Judd is not alone in making these mistakes. Yeah. Well, and it's a good, it's a good thing to keep an eye on. I think as we go through the rest of this off season, obviously we're hoping that they bring in star power or guys that are really legitimate ads to this team, guys like Cody Bellinger, of course, but they have to be better about that depth stuff as well. We don't need to belabor the point of how they started last season and just wasted so many plate appearances and opportunities at first and third and the DH position. But you got to be better about those things. Like those things are a significant contributor to winning or losing an extra handful of games that ultimately may swing a wild card race or a division race or whatever type of race you end up in. In the front office made those quality moves, like the U.S. front office made those quality moves in the early 2010s, right? Trading for Pedro Strope and Jake Arrieta at the time, they were considered uh, kind of flyers. They did hit on those, and they ended up being some of the most— got a ton of contribution out of guys. Yes. Travis Wood, Trevor Cahill. Yes. Like playing like real roles in, yes. in pennant races and things like that. Like that's the stuff you're not necessarily— Now, you they, they, they haven't missed everywhere. Like Julian Merriweather, of course, a very good example. So it's not— it's not that the entire sum is zero, but you need more success than what they're... It's never yeah. a black and white situation. Yeah. In having a two-win pillow go from 80 to 82, more incentive to go out and make that trade, right? Because you have a two-win cover, three-win cover. They start adding up. One, one more guy that... And then we'll hit our first ad break yeah. here that I think highlights, again, the... Sometimes you can't build... You can't build everything in one year, right? So it's not necessarily insane, and I think we all knew this. That's why the my whole expectation or hope was like, be the favorite in your division, which is begging for someone to take it over. This is the one of the, maybe the easiest the NL Central has looked. I don't want to say in our lifetime, but this is a soft... In recent memory. Yeah, it's a soft yeah. version of this, especially with the Brewers seemingly toning things down a little bit. But when you can't... Rome wasn't built in a day, but you also can't just wait for the perfect time to push it all in. Going back to what I was saying about guys not being available, John Lester, right? <laughs> I feel like is the perfect example for this, Brendan. They were coming off a year where they felt they were going in the right direction and heading into 2015, the expectation was nowhere near where that team would end up taking them. Yeah. They had so many young players. There were so many unanswered questions, but the trend was going up. And you knew at some point we are going to need an anchor of our rotation. Kyle Hendricks was nowhere near established as the version of Kyle Hendricks. Another good trade, now. by the way, that Theo made. Dempster for Kyle Hendricks. Yeah. So you had to look at things and go, we need an ace. We need an anchor. We need the guy we pencil in for 30 starts and 200 innings every year. Were they ready to win in 2015? Ultimately, they would show that they were close, obviously. 
But no, they were not. They were not ready to push all their chips in as an organization. That's why they didn't make any of those crazy trades that were rumored at the 2015 deadline. But John Lester was only available in that offseason. If you wanted him to be that guy and answer that question for the next six or so years, you had to make that decision before you were really ready as an organization. If you always wait until the time is perfect, if you always wait until the contract is perfect and everything is the way you want it as a baseball executive, you're going to get no one and you're going to go nowhere. Yeah. Yeah, I, that moment doesn't come very often, Brendan. It's so rare that a moment like the 2016 trade deadline even comes up for a lot of these teams where you felt like the Cubs need one thing. If they go and get that one thing, they're going to go win the World Series. And that's exactly how it worked out. It really doesn't happen like that that often where it's a simple sort of like we just go a to b and c is winning the world series there you go like that's just what we need to do it's very rarely like that yeah and i know jed knows this but i'm just watching all the guys they pass up and this is going back to the discussion we had and i know luke cody and ryan talked about it on their show on thursday afternoon just like the list of players they have just decided it's not the right time for or that didn't want to come to chicago or they didn't make the big trade for it's a long list man and any one of those guys would look good on the team now and would be helping your projections for the next several years. Yeah, and where the Cubs currently stand, which is unfortunately, if you were to put me against a wall, I would say given the current market, trade market and free agent market, I don't think it makes sense. Operating underneath these luxury taxes and financial constraints that the ownership has, I don't know if it makes sense to go out and make these massive moves anymore. I personally, before I do the ad break, I keep saying this, I personally was operating under the idea that we would get a Juan Soto-esque player. Someone in whom you can sink a lot of value in. Five wins, six wins, seven wins, allows you to have greater flexibility to make other moves and push that win projection north of 94 wins. I don't see where that's going to happen anymore. Now the question is, do I want to give up some of these top three, top four prospects for the rumored players? Probably not right. because you're not able to stack those players up anymore. So then it starts to, I start to question, well, maybe 2023, 2024 is more of a soft 2015-esque year i i know that but I, where I, I know i know you are only speaking you're operating in what you think you know what i reality think. yes might be not what you want but no boy i i i i, I, I can't i i like don't even want to be party to the conversation I know. And, and so <laughs> and here's my last here's my last point on this whole like probability and all this like nonsense over here is that what you sound like to to you i really think i do I, I, I even hate talking about because I know how it comes off. Like, I'm fully aware how, like, I look like you the greatest. You put up a graph greatest. Like four minutes into the show today. So I was ready, dude. Me. I was ready. I, I know that this is, this is a horrible look, but whatever. I just go with this, who I am. But where the Cubs are right now and looking towards the future, I – when I bring up, like, Kevin Gossman and other past deals and, like, Kodai Senga – you know, I kind of joke about it, but 85, whatever it was, 100 million for, for saying a 110, 120 for Gossman. Like, that's what I kind of reference. And I look at the Cubs' current team right now. A lot of their, like, they don't have cost controllable players at a pre ARB or arbitration level price. You look at their current roster, the corners are stacked up for about 20 million per year in Saya and in, 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 uh, in Hap. The middle infield's locked down, got Dansby for 25 ish, and you got Nico at the, his remaining three years left. Center field is a void. The corners are a void. There's no cost controllable talent there. In order for the Cubs to stay within these financial boundaries, at some point, they're going to need those positions filled with pre-arb to arbitration level guys. <laughs> and the reality is the farm system has never been more primed to fill that void. And from Jed's perspective, 
for them to be competitive for the next five years. He he needs he needs that, and this team does need that. So it's a weird situation to be in. I hate how I could tell. I hate how I could tell where that was going. He wants to see PCA be a four, three to five win player. He wants but, to see Canario be a contributing player. He wants to see Morel play third base every day and still put up a 120 in, OPS but, before he says, okay, now we're going to dump the Brinks truck into this team. But, but you know why, too? That's because what you're saying, right? Yeah, and you know why, too? Because you can't project the team, right? So if you're at 80, 82 wins... Remember, the Cubs were projected as 78 wins last year. Their Pythag expected record was thir- was 13 higher, at 91 wins. Yeah. That was within, Corey, that's within one like standard deviation. So if they're around 80 to 85, shut up. <laughs> Screw you. I hate you so much. I'm being 100% serious here. This is how, this is a high standard deviation. No Dude. way. <laughs> All right, I'm going to finish this, and then I have to do this stupid ad read with you, but sorry, whatever. Sorry. Actually, a great ad read. I don't want to say stupid. I'm stupid. But like, you can imagine that's where they're going to operate. And because there is – here's the thing. Baseball is so dumb. There is a world in which we are a 90-plus win team next year. It's not even that crazy to think about because they're around 80 to 85 wins. So I do want to point that out there, too. It's not to say, oh, they're screwed. Like They actually have a relatively decent chance at making the playoffs next year. It's a weird, it, it is a weird spot. Because like I said when we started this, like it's not like I think this is a 60-win team. This is some disaster no. of a team. This is the worst organization in sport. Like, of course not. But it is just, it is... Though it is those moments where you're watching the Otani thing play out, you're watching the Soto trade play out, you're watching Otani's press conference, then immediately they follow it up and go get Glass now, and maybe you're going to extend Glass now. It it's just those moments where it's like, man, like I yeah. I have tried to be patient, I have tried to buy into the vision, and. I I still see a lot of it, but I'm impatient, man. That I, I just I want them to act in line with everything else. I want the team to act in line with their ticket prices, with their Forbes valuation, with the way everybody in the organization talks about them. Like, I just want that to show up on the field. Again, as always, whether it's realistic or not, and I said many times, it wasn't even the ex- expectation I was holding them to this offseason. I, I, like, I want to watch a 105-win team, man. Like, I'm not, I'm not I mean, sorry so do about I. that. I don't care about how they can finesse the the luxury tax to get to 88 wins and maybe win the division. Like, I don't care about that. I'm a, I'm a fan. I tried working in front offices, Brendan. They, they didn't want me anymore. So it, I don't get paid to do that anymore. So I don't care about that. I want to watch a juggernaut at Wrigley Field, and I've given them time to build one, and I think they're – it's taking way too long. They're like it, way too long. It's taking longer than even I think the front office imagined. Let's do our first ad break here. Come back, continue this conversation. It's I can be another three. I mean, I can you, tell the the amount. A little inside baseball for all of our listeners. If you're joining us on YouTube, hello, we can see you. Yeah. You can also see Brendan's graphs. If you're listening on your podcast feed later, we love you. We appreciate you as always. A little inside baseball, like half the time Brennan and I get on, and sometimes when the Cubs haven't done anything, we're like, what What should we talk about? We already highlighted Christopher Morrell. Let's not dive too deep in him again. We talked about Glass now for 40 minutes. We can't do too much on that. We already gave our thoughts on Otani. We don't really need to go back into it. And then yada, yada, yada. It's the <laughs> hour and 40-minute mark, and the two of us won't shut up. And then we, we're like, well, guess we had something to talk about. <laughs> We're heading down that trajectory right now. It does. All right, Corey, let's do these ad breaks here. Finally, 20 minutes overdue, but we have made it. It's getting easier for businesses to switch to electric vehicles. That's something we can all get behind for the health of the planet and for the well-being of all of us who share it. That is right. Brendan, the electric grid is evolving to meet your cleaner energy needs as we all move with confidence toward an electric tomorrow. Whether you have one delivery van or a whole fleet of shipping trucks, ComEd can help you guide to make the changes that make sense. So what should business owners do? 
Go to comed.com slash clean to learn more about the resources, fleet rebates, and infrastructure incentives available to help businesses go electric. If you own a business, don't wait. Start making your plan to switch to electric vehicles. Good for business, good for the planet, good for all of us. Go to comed.com slash clean. Did you say comed.com slash clean? That's right, Brendan. Go now and see how going electric connects us to a better way of doing business and a better future for generations to come. Okay. CHGO is supported by Goose Island Beer Company, Chicago's beer since 1988. They have a deep beer roster, the Oktoberfest, the Beer Hug Family, the 312 Wheat Ale, the Full Pocket Pilsner, the Everyday Beer is what the brewers are drinking. Grab Ultra Fresh Brewery exclusive beers at Goose Island's original brew house from their tap room on Fulton Street in Westtown. Goose Island Beer Company, Chicago's beer. All right, Brendan, we're back. We're back. I don't know. I don't want to like sound like we're like sitting here complaining and griping about stuff because I and I don't think I think if anybody on this episode comes off that way, it's me, not you. You're the one trying to like figure out what they're doing. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I kind of have to for my own sanity. And, like, I, I understand that. And deep down, I know well enough to know what you're talking about and even appreciate some of it, the logic behind it. But I'm, I'm not going to lie about being impatient and a little frustrated. Yeah. If we come a month from now and they've got Bellinger and Imanaga and some bullpen help and maybe someone like Reese Hoskins or another guy to sort of supplement and play DH or whatever it may be, like, fine. I, that's a that's a solid team. The projection would be solid. Their standing in the NL Central would be what I asked for, and then you continue to build. But I'm not going to lie. I I just I couldn't shake the constant discussion and propping up of the Braves and the Dodgers and just how good and smart and how much money and it's being like okay, well, cool that the Cubs just aren't part of that discussion i guess like uh, that's just not what they're doing and i know so many of you will say the braves won one title the dodgers have only won a fake title in 2020 i hear you but like the process is really good i i i like brendan i studied at the theo epstein school of <laughs> baseball management which is process isn't linear and process over results that's how he always taught us to think and i i still believe that so their process is really good. The Dodgers and Braves' process to trying to win a World Series is there really go. good. They can't there control that, as Brendan says, baseball is very stupid. So. It's, it's really a, a, a ridiculous sport. I, and where I come away with – and by the way, talking with you this week, I don't think I've ever remembered you being so down about – the team, uh, honest to God, I, and I'm not trying to throw you under the bus. I understand where you are right now, but like this is even darker for you than 2021 and 2022. I I don't know if I'm wrong interpreting that, but again, you, there, there's a lot of time left. We'll see what happens, but I I just really believed that they were going to attack stuff. You thought season. you thought, and correct me if I'm wrong. You thought they would be a 95-plus win team on paper going into next year. Is that fair? No. Okay. I think I acknowledge then you're that kind of getting delusional. to that kind of high point was, was very difficult in just one offseason. Okay, but well, I then just, maybe— I just expected them—and again, maybe they will. But, like, <laughs> I expected them to act serious. Like, we are done in this kind of, like, weird middle ground. We are the Chicago Cubs, and we're here to act like it. And you got that sense— and and maybe still do from some the the Otani stuff sort of threw everything for a loop because that's all everybody was covering. But I remember coming into the off season like some of the writers did feel that way. I think I'm Mark Feinsand, JP Morosi, and now you know nobody trusts him anymore as they shouldn't. I don't know why he did that, but like they had the sense like they're they're gonna remind people they're the Chicago Cubs. And, you know, to be fair, Jesse Rogers sort of always said he didn't see it that way. Yeah. That they would improve, but that they were not going to go nuts or do anything insane. So we'll see. But, yeah, man, like, I I just expected this to be – like, 2021, I knew what was going on. I knew it was on the wall. I'm not an idiot. And even though I wasn't happy about how they went about it, like, I, I, under, I understood. It's easy to see what was happening. This, I just I, – I thought they were ready to – 
break free and like really unleash this this team and their 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 bank and Phil Wrigley to the brim again with an absolute no doubt playoff team. Yeah, and maybe they will, but it's just slow. It's either the whole off season has been slow, and I'm getting impatient. I'm not going to lie about that. I I think where you and I differ is I've kind of been at that point for the past four, like four seasons, five Apathy. seasons. I guess if you want to call it <laughs> that, but the, for me the writing was on <laughs> baseball apathy. <laughs> yeah. But for me the writing was on the wall when I always point back to it, but like when Darvish was traded and not to relitigate all of that, I understand I can even understand the logic of getting back, you know, Owen Casey and Preciado and those guys, but you might remember leading up to that trade, those two days beforehand, we're hearing about Cronenworth. We're hearing about yeah, getting that. back major league value. And that was always underneath my expectation that we you would just, get. You just really are upset they didn't get a Michigan man. Is that what it is? <laughs> I, I guess I am. Yeah. Is that what it is? Yeah, those, those Michigan guys. You brought up Cronenworth. All very you? morale athletes they got over there and yeah. coaches. Uh, but but I, I kind of figured the writing was on the wall that Jed was going to behave a little bit differently than what we've seen from, from Theo and, and that era. And instinctively, I just disagree with that logic. And I'm not even saying that is the right way to go about it, being more aggressive and going to try to get major value. But the way I think about it, and the reason why I wanted to show that graph to start the show, was because you can't really project teams with accuracy. So while Theo and Jed in the past wanted to do that, they did get a little bit lucky and they got those 100 win seasons. For Jed, I feel as if he has a better understanding of where the team's going to be in 2024, 2025, 2026. And I asked myself the question, well, why do you think that? Because really, you can't confidently think that. So the way I operate is still account for that risk, and I keep saying this, but be a little bit more aggressive. Don't go out and trade the U Darvishes for teenagers. Try to get back some major league value because yeah. you're like, you know, a few weeks away from being like an upper 80s playoff win team. And you can find yourself in the World Series like the Phillies have and the Nationals have and the D-backs recently and the Cardinals back in the mid-2000s. And I will always stand by that. That's just how I'm always going to operate. So you call it, don't push all your chips in. I'm not even asking for that. I'm yeah. asking to bring back Jed's and, and Craig's favorite phrase, stack decisions, better decisions upon good decisions that have a little bit more projectable immediate impact rather than the longer terms. I don't think you can project these uh, with accuracy. Yeah, I think I was watching a clip that our guy Cody Del Mendo put out from one of the shows that him and Luke and Ryan did earlier this week, which of course you can check on the CHGO Sports YouTube page. But you guys already watch every episode of the CHGO Cubs podcast, oh, right? Oh, yeah. And he was talking about how, like, you, 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 you know a lot more about this team right now, of course, than you did last year. But, like, you have answered some questions, especially heading into 2023. And he was talking about how, like, you, you know a lot, you have a good feeling about a, a decent number of these players. So like now, as you're saying, like now's the time, I think Cody put it like to be bold, like go and, and supplement this group, like make a big move, a big splash, like something that, that rounds this whole thing in together. And I, I just thought it was a good point. Like you, you've learned a lot about where guys like Nico Horner and Hap and even say a Suzuki toward the end of the year. And of course there's still unknowns with some of them, but like you have a good feel for the sort of like key group of this team go in and supplement it. Right. Yeah. Like it's not a group that necessarily has infinite questions. Certain portions of it do Talkman, Tyone, et cetera. But a guy like Justin Steele is pushed through and sort of answered some of those questions to what degree he'll keep it up is a question, but like he's answered like, Hey, you, you have an, you have an ACE, you have a top of the rotation guy here. Christopher Morell doesn't have a position, but he's showing you he can hit. He's even hitting in the winter league. He won't stop hitting. <laughs> 
Dansby, Nico, Hap, these guys have shown you like what they can do and who they are. Like now is the time to sort of like go in and help them win. And yeah. there's still time to, but I don't know. And then like, I, I don't know, man, how do I feel like they go and bring <laughs> Cody Bellinger back? Congratulations on replacing the, <laughs> the four <laughs> bringing wins. Back the same, like, bringing back the same roster. For that? Like, right. Okay, and, yeah. and again, they're they're better than they were at the beginning of 2023, for sure, because you're not going to start Trey Mancini, you're not going to start Tucker Barnhart. Even better idea start. of your current roster, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. But, I don't know. I don't I know, don't. man. I, I'm just in a weird, a weird spot with this team. I really need them to do something, like, of any significance. And I think that's fair. I think there's room for for nuance in this discussion and on social media not to criticize the wonderful social media that exists in the world today but i find myself cringing at even simple tweets that i put out because you get these broad brushstrokes of this is good you're you know this is what the cup should be doing not signing these guys versus they need to go all in and everything and i don't want to have that conversation i think there's room to be disappointed and, and frustrated even though they haven't made a move yet the reason that i'm hope hopefully i'm expressing the reason i am disappointed and i have no problem saying i am disappointed i am disappointed where this cubs current team is i think that's fair i think it's justifiable and my expectation is unrealistic and i understand that but this team this team deserves to be looked at like the Dodgers and like the Braves. And they're not even close to that. Right. And it is okay to mention that and be frustrated about it while at the same time acknowledging maybe some of these high-end moves now as they exist today isn't the right course of action. And there's gray area there. Also acknowledging that, hey, I like Dan Kantrovitz. I really like Tommy Hadovy. I like the Daniel Moskos concepts in the pitching lab. And I like how they've drafted well recently with uh, Shaw and, and graduating Jordan Wicks really fast. I'm pretty excited about that. I, have, I actually feel like the team is heading in a good direction. I acknowledge that. I, though, am, am greedy and it's to to me, fair or not, dumb fan or not, it's not enough. It's really not. And I bring up the Trey Mancinis and the Sogars and the VRs, not to poke fun at it. I know, not to poke fun at it, even though it is kind of funny in hindsight. But truly, those were awful decisions. And again, when I project players, you look at the stats from 2021, 2022. Similarly, you look at the process to your point that was used to find the team now in an 80 win situation and dating back three, four five wins. The process was not good enough, Corey. This is why we're talking about the team the way we are right now. I think this is an isolated point, but you started it. Okay. I think that Eric Sogard is the only player that was wearing a Cubs uniform that I have ever booed at Wrigley Field. Did you boo Eric Sogard? Are you kidding? I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. I don't think I've ever booed a player Every in my time entire he was life. On the field, Ugh. and that and <laughs> that that was awful. That was an in, that was an affront to all of us. One hundred and eighty plate appearances to Eric Sogard that year. And that's what I'm talking about. And so he what he is, was also pitching. He, he got innings. Oh, the the Shohei Otani before Shohei Otani became himself. But I think, but, like in in the thing, I don't I don't really find booing of the Cubs players to be something that is productive or that I find personally like acceptable. But I'm not I, I'm not a loud fan anyway, so I I never boo. But I'm like surprised you booed. I you you usually sit there with your headphones in. You're just a quiet person. That's playoffs. True. Yeah. That's playoffs, which unfortunately I wouldn't know anything about that <laughs> yeah. uh, in the last six years. So Isn't that I'm crazy? A think foreign on the, I'm a little rusty on the playoff routine. Isn't that kind of crazy? Think about though, it's been that long, like for real. It's, it's been not like crazy. I think about it all the time. I mean, so it's been <laughs> what almost seven I years think most now. Of the people listening or watching this think about that all the time. Yeah, it's nuts. All right, let's let's do the second ad break here. We'll come back. Maybe talk about the glass now stuff if you want, and maybe you know bring up like the Bieber situation well, and all this. For the for the end of the episode, I think let's talk about, and we've certainly touched on some of them, but pivoting, right? 
Otani's yeah. gone. Soto's gone. Yep. Glass now's gone. Glass now for a while seemed like he was going to uh, be dude, in Chicago. In my in my head, I, I I thought he was a cop. Yeah. Like I I bought into it. So, and that's another one. Like I don't care so much about Glass now in a vacuum, but like if they really did have interest in them. Well done, right? You waited around until the Dodgers decided that they were just going to swoop in and take him from you. And I don't know that that's how it happened, but, like, there was a lot of smoke to that fire only for the Dodgers to get the smoke, like, a, a day after they signed Otani. And then it was like, oh, yeah, he's not going to the Cubs. So I, what, whatever happened there, whatever, I don't know, man. but it's just another one where it's like, man, I really hope, like, behind the scenes they didn't really want glass now because it— <laughs> Just does it. It's not a good look if they really did. Well, they've they fumbled trays before. The, the Wilson Contreras. I know the Houston Astros nixed it at the dead at the very last second. But like, you know, he didn't have a backup plan. Wilson well, was only so a QL. Well, before you hit that that break though, that's what I'm that's what I'm saying is is my main concern at the moment. It's not that I don't believe they're going to try to spend money or have a real intention to make this team better. But I always like to use the the phrase like threading a needle. The, the the needle becomes a lot smaller when the players come off the board. Yeah. Not every player in the league is is really available at any given time. There's a pool of players that certain teams are willing to trade because of financial reasons or contract reasons. There's a certain pool of free agents. There's a certain pool of waiver guys that are available at any given moment. So it it's just one of those things you look at and it's like, okay, fine. Maybe they were never a serious suitor for Shohei Otani. Maybe they were never fully in on Juan Soto because they just don't want to do the one-year deal thing and they're going to pursue him next offseason if he reaches it. Fine. In a vacuum, it's all fine. I said at one point, I don't care who they get. I just want the team to be better. But each guy that comes off the board, you had better hope that your trade is the best offer or the one that they want. Like in this instance, it's very possible that the Cubs pulled out. I've seen some people say they maybe wanted glass now if they did get Otani so that they had a pitcher for the one year that Otani I mean, that makes sense. Who knows? It does make sense. So maybe they just pulled out and they weren't interested anymore. But it's also possible maybe the Rays really liked the lead prospect that they got from the Dodgers. And they were waiting for the Dodgers to call. And they said, hey— Jed, we hear you on Hayden Wisniewski and Ben Brown or whoever they were offering, but we like this guy better. We're, we're going to go with this. This is the guy that the Rays front office really wants. It's possible. It's possible for Shane Bieber. You think you have a good offer? Somebody else comes and beats it. It could be the Dodgers. <laughs> you think you're? You, you think this is lining up for you? We're going to get Cody Bellinger. We're going to get him on a deal similar to Dansby. And then Toronto calls and says, throw $50 million on it to come play yep. up north. What do you do? Yeah. That's, that's the concern that is creeping in to me, is that it's not about any individual player, and it's not that I don't think they're going to try, but best laid plans in this territory don't always come to fruition you don't control all of it the Shohei Otani thing is as good an example as anything it seemed he literally didn't want to go anywhere else yeah so maybe the Cubs could have offered him a billion dollars but if he really wanted to be a Dodger he really Nothing wanted can to do be a Dodger it. what are you gonna do yeah. if Imanaga visits a bunch of cities and he says I love Seattle or I love San, San Francisco. Francisco I want to yeah. be on the west coast that's all that I know about America. The Los I don't Angeles. care about the Midwest. I don't want to deal with the snow. What can you do? What can Jed do? Nothing. Nothing. You can Dude, buy them a I, sauna the inside thing. their, like, their yeah, mansion. That's, that's, I think, why so many people are uneasy and impatient is because the, the list of options dwindles, but the holes still remain. Yeah. And you have to find players to fill them, but you don't always get a say in that. I feel as if they will improve. I feel as if the team will be competitive next year. I think they will be division contenders. And I think there's a good chance that by the time we do this podcast next year, we'll be in a much better place. I don't think it's likely because where they're at, but I also consider the worst outcome of being like a 65, 70 win team. I consider that less likely. And so because of that, where they stand right now, even without some of these deals, I feel okay. Like to be, you know, fully transparent with you, if they are just 
interesting. Deep down inside, I'm okay with that. And I will always be okay with that. If I can wake up on a Saturday morning and I know I can turn on a Cubs game at 1.20 p.m. and expect some interest, some competition, a meaningful baseball game, I, as crazy as that sounds, that's all I want. I would Listen, love them to be a juggernaut, but that's Listen, all I want. I will laugh and laugh and laugh and dance in the streets of Chicago with glee when Javier Assad outduels Tyler Glass now in the NLDS <laughs> to knock out the Dodgers after he strikes out Otani and Freeman and Betts oh, wow. in Look order to finish a complete game where Nick Madrigal wow. homers playing third base yep. and batting lead off to Mike Talkman is is the NLCS MVP. I, I can't I can't wait. Sure. All I'm saying is I think like you, I think we could add like a little more safety to that <laughs> <laughs> to that plan. Right? That would, be, that would be great. I think we could like add some assurances that the roster is is better th than that. But yes, so, that'll be very funny. I look forward to that. It'll be sure, very funny let's, let's do that. to see uh, which team that just is riding good vibes knocks the 130 win Dodgers and Braves out of the playoffs. I hope it's the Cubs. If you want some assurance for some high quality Corey, Charlie the Bacon Guy is based out of Woodridge, Illinois, and he makes craft bacon and bacon jams in over 30 different flavors. The bacon and bacon jams are an all naturally cured, fancy preservative free product. There aren't any ingredients that Charlie can't pronounce himself involved in the process, unlike most store bought bacon. It's also vacuum sealed, freezes great, lasts in the package up to 45 days in the fridge and six months in the freezer. The bacon jam lasts about 60 days in the fridge or usually about 20 seconds in my house and up to six months in the freezer. Several different favorites, ma maple pepper, Nashville hot, French toast, buffalo, ranch, jalapeno, garlic. There's the bacon jam flavor such as the original traditional one, the bourbon, spicy, or even peach. The bacon jam goes perfectly in anything, scrambled eggs, toast, crackers, burgers, grilled cheese, cinnamon rolls, or Charlie's favorite, the spoon. You can pick it up the most efficient way, or he would deliver it right to you, or even meet you halfway, or even ship it. He makes the bacon so you can bring it home. And starting now until December 15th, today actually, you can save 10% off on your order at charliethebaconguy.com when you use code CHGO10. Get your orders in and use that code to save. Put the bacon jam on pizza. I've said it before. Have you done that? Say it again. Yes. I'm actually pretty interested in that. That sounds I, good. A savory taste. That is something that, and I'm sh I'm sure they didn't invent it, but there's a yeah. place in Chicago in Logan Square called Pauly G's that has like a breakfast pizza. Okay. And they put bacon jam on it. That's where I first heard of this exercise. And then when we got the Charlie the Bacon Guy stuff, I was like, well, I don't know what I have to do with this. <laughs> Well, there you go. From Corey Friedman himself. Put it on your pizza. Okay, second break here. Uh, with Empire Today, you get shop at home convenience, the right product for your needs, quick and professional installation, and a low price guarantee. Empire Today is the best place to get new flooring. So, of course, they have copycats, but Empire can't be can't be beaten on quality service speeds. So competitors advertise low quality products that Empire simply will not carry. Empire won't promise the lowest prices because anyone who does that is just putting flooring in your home that they wouldn't put in their own home. Empire's virtual floor designer is a great way to see how new floors will look in any space. It's easy. Just snap a picture and instantly see how new floors will look in your own room. Shopping for floors at big box stores can be frustrating. You might talk to someone today who was working in plumbing yesterday. Flooring is all Empire Today does. They leave, they live and breathe flooring so you can be confident you're getting honest upfront advice. So schedule a free in-home estimate today. All listeners can receive a $350 off discount when they use the promo code CHGO. Restrictions do apply. See empiretoday.com slash CHGO for details. 
And Corey, are you in the market for a new vehicle? If you are, then we have some great news for you. Our partner, Ray Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram in Fox Lake is making room on their lot for incoming 2024 vehicles. And you know what that means. You'll be able to shop incredible savings on every new vehicle in stock during their limited time wrap up to save wrap up the year sales event for a limited time get up to 15 percent off new 2024 jeep grand cherokees with dealer discount at ray cdjr you'll always be able to shop one of chicagoland's largest inventories and drive home with more money in your pocket than you'd expect thanks to ray's price promise don't miss out shop great deals all month long and save big because ray cdjr makes buying a new vehicle more affordable than Ever, but that's not all. Just for listening, you can get a free oil change when you mention CHGO at the service center or mention CHGO when you book online at Ray CDJR slash service. Hurry in. You must book before December 31st. So if you're in the market for a new vehicle, then you have to check out the team at Ray Chrysler Dodge Jeep and Ram because they are the only team we recommend. Visit them today at Route 12 in Fox Lake. And for more information, visit Ray CDJR in Fox Lake or RayCDJR.com. Serving the community since 1963 hell yeah um all right now i'm all, i'm all over the place how, how much does your opinion on all this change if a lot actually yes i know <laughs> Let, let's say i told you right now that christopher morell learns how to throw from third base is okay. solid there let's say he's an average defender yeah but he can play there every day, hits. How you, how are you feeling if you could like lock that in right now? Uh, like he can play third base. He's your third baseman. Yeah, I'm fine with that. Yeah. No, I but mean, I'm like, saying, the, how much does it how much does it change your feeling on their their roster, their situation? If you knew he could play above than above adequate I see. third base. You add two wins. That's how I see it. You go from 80 to 82 wins, to use your example earlier in the show. Uh, it prohibits them from getting Matt Chapman, so you free up more money in the long term that way. Sure. If I know you listen, man, a recent interest in him. But. He might be on the Cubs, so watch your words. He might be on the Cubs well, in the next okay, like, two listen, weeks. It's, it's all about the price. That, that's, he might that's do. It. Some of the price tags are like pretty nice. Like I think MLB Trade Rumors put out like four years for eighty million. Look, are you, you kidding? Want to create just an infield that just vacuums base. Fine, go ahead. <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying that would be like a, the best like infield a of all time. Maybe when the when we were looking at the free agent list, maybe come mid season or things like that, I feel like there was an air about it that he was going to get paid a big time corner kind of guy. And I think his May on at the plate has drifted that value lower. If the value's right, fine. But I just I I don't look at him as a guy that is like a let's pay money and like lock this up for several years. That feels like the type of thing that you're not not going to enjoy doing a few years from now. Listen, that's not my preference. That's not my preference. Like I'm not saying, oh, he is priority number one. No, my priority is improve elsewhere, shorter term. Because you have a lot of volatility. I've always wanted Morel at third base. I've said this for two years now. Please play him at third base. Go through the growing pains. And to your point, if you can figure out his throwing accuracy, the mechanics at the corner, I mean, that's best case outcome. Does it change how I think? Uh, yeah, of course it's going to change how I think. If the Cubs are actually concerned he can't do that, then maybe I might be more interested in Matt Chapman because even Matt I mean, Shaw coming up, you can't rely on that, right? So maybe... I don't know. Hey, if you put Chapman at third, uh, it's possible the ball never gets through the left side of the infield. So that's it's. I mean, then you put PCA in center. You got Nico at second base. I mean, it's like unbelievable defense. You can have to do it in Gold Glove in left field to put him in there as well. Even though he got screamed at for doing it, but you know he is a Gold Glover. That might be where the Cubs turn to. Then you supplement that with a shorter term pillow contract and Reese Hoskins, right? So let's say you sign or Chapman, who just mashes as your DH. I mean, where are you going to get that? It's not on the free. It's not on the open market right now, unless you trade for someone, right? Solaire. Oh man, he's he's injured every three weeks. I love Solaire, but like, man, you got to slot in some projectability here. Uh, so let's say you sign Chapman for uh, twenty million. There, you signed Hoskins twenty twenty five million. You're looking at forty forty five million. Then you're at two hundred thirty million. 
just underneath that first tier. You have a lot more room to go. Like you have a lot more room to improve and a lot more room before you hit the third tier of the tax. Where I think they end up Man, given I, listen, I'm just gonna tell you if they if they <laughs> if there's no Bellinger and they replace it all with <clears throat> Matt Chapman and Reese Hoskins, I am not gonna be happy. You're gonna listen to me complain. Don't <laughs> at, at this point in the in the off season. Yeah. I am not going to be surprised if that's the outcome. And I'm not happy about it either. Okay. Well, then and, everybody for everyone's mental health better hope that Reese Hoskins' knee is great and he's about to put up, you know, a high eight OPS because otherwise, oh boy. Well, let me turn it to you then. How, yeah. What's your limit for Cody Bellinger? He's a tricky one. Man, we've talked about that a lot, but he he is a, a rather tricky one. I think to me, I'm more. Con- I don't. You're the one that looks at the luxury tax and stuff. I operate as if money is. <laughs> it, I have a credit card that I'd never have to pay the bill. Well, right. The In reason terms of the Cubs. It's not my. Well, you're here. you're more distraught than I am right now. So no, like, I'm, I'm. What I'm saying is that my whole thing with Cody is just the years. If you can keep it to like six or seven, do whatever you want. I don't. I don't really care. Obviously, so like. A, Obviously, there's a number that is ridiculous to pay yeah. because there's risks. But six, seven years, the flexibility he has positionally, I think, you, you know, you're not going to pay him 40 minutes. They're not going to do anything insane. So it's like, fine. That would be fine. I'm I mean, more I, I feel about the years than I am the money. I Cody. feel as all of our interest has grown to Cody, like much higher recently because sure. you lost out on Soto, Yamamoto probably. Yeah. Otani's gone, right? Like personally for me, Bellinger's priority number one. He feels and, like a yeah, it's a total key to this whole thing. He, and he, there, it, he it's interesting because he did at the beginning and then everybody drifted to like the Soto Otani territory, like no, oh, no, maybe. Yeah, yeah. And then a lot of people are now back in the oh, they have to get Bellinger camp. Yeah. Right. I I was That's more agnostic. I, personally, I, was, I did that. I'm talking about sure. me. Yeah, I was more agnostic towards it. If they went out and got these big guys. I'm like, you know, I like Bellinger, a great year, but like at least they improved elsewhere. Those guys are gone. Now it's Bellinger. I feel as if it's Bellinger or bust for you and I. Yeah, kind of personally. And that is kind of an uncomfortable sluggers. I know, but it's such it's an un it is an uncomfortable feeling though to some degree, not because of the price tag in the years, but also because like this is kind of it, right? And they. They didn't just have him, but like Toronto and San Francisco have the same issue we <laughs> I, talk about with the Cubs. They're they're not winning enough for how they want to be, and they only have a certain amount of paths to address that. So like I don't know if he's interested in any of those teams. I don't know if they're interested in him. But I don't I don't think this is gonna be something where like he's he's not gonna come crawling back to the Cubs. There are some people who do not want Bellinger, by the way. And the reason they point the reason they say that is because they point to his, your favorite term, expected weighted on base average, Corey. And <laughs> whether it's justified or not, some of the bad ball data is a little interesting where he had like a 335, 340X Woba. I personally think this, not personally, it's a fact it's because of all those B hacks he took with two strikes. But there is some people who do not want to spend money and years on Bellinger because of the bad ball data and because of the previous shoulder injury and the two extremely There's poor years. And they're exactly right. And so is there risk in signing Bellinger? And would it be an overreaction if they signed him for like 200 plus million? If the Cubs signed Bellinger for over 200 million, I am going to be shocked. I think the only way he comes back to the Cubs is on a Dansby type contract where it's six years, seven years, you know, 25 million, 27 million per year. And that's that anything over 200, I would be floored if Jed brought him back. Yeah. Even if the team is yeah, worse going into next year. <laughs> I don't know what I'm to in, tell you, man. I'm intrigued by like Imanaga. Yeah. But even with like, uh, you know, projecting the team, even Naga still has some risk associated with that, right? Where you can maybe offset that risk with Shane Bieber is coming off a few injuries as well. But there's still a lot of risk signing a 30 year old without having the experience of major league baseball playing consistent day games at Wrigley, the routine, sure. the natural age decline. I don't, I don't know. I but feel the, rota- the rotation needs something. I, I, I just bring I know, but I'm operating in Jed's mindset over yeah, here. Yeah, but it just doesn't sound like they are a lead suitor 
for I have an idea. Yamamoto. I have an and idea. And they, you know, you don't have Strowman. Uh, you don't know that. Don't even. I'm just saying, if you want certainty, Strowman's mark is not robust. I believe it or not, believe it or not, I have come You're around like to the idea. Push me off the cliff with some. I. This is our reality. Like Corey, if wake up. Was Matt wake Chapman, up. Reese Hoskins and Marcus Stroman. Yeah, man, wake up. Where have you been? Where have you been? Why? The, 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 the roles have reversed. Usually I'm the one kind of freaking out. Like you're in a weird trans state right now. Like you're not even in reality. Yeah, this I, is our reality. I I'm freaking out because I'm naive. You freak out. I don't know why. I don't know why either. I'm still trying to figure it out. If you have an idea, let me know. But uh, <laughs> but, but I, seriously, I've grown to the idea of Strowman on a two-year contract, bring him back for two years, guaranteed $20 million per year. Like It's a short-term contract. His market's not robust. You know what you have in him. You have all of his medicals. You know what he does well and what doesn't. What he doesn't I do well. We have. I don't want it anymore. Okay. Well, you know how Jed operates. He wants to understand. He wants to project value with certainty. That's why he didn't sign the other shortstop besides Dancy Swanson because of the high base. You know the base with Stroman if he's healthy. He, listen, if Stroman's healthy, outside of that freak rib injury, he's a well above league average pitcher for that price tag, no, and you know that's valuable. No, no, no. I, I agree he's been reliable, and I think his Cubs tenure was better than I think some people remember it for whatever reason. Uh, but I, I just was ready to move on and I was hoping that they would make the rotation better, not just replace him with literally him. So, and, so, you know, the, frankly, like we're deep in this episode. So like, this is pretty, what are we at here? One deep, hour, 17. Like, I, so I, I, this isn't something I've had like two glasses of wine. I, I was not a particular fan of, he is I am very supportive of players using whatever platform they have and doing whatever they want with it. Talk shit, be nice, sell products, do whatever you want. I was not a particular fan of how he disappeared when he started to struggle. I, I That did rub me the wrong way. I'm not going to lie about that. He He is very loud and boisterous and self-promoting, which, again, I have no issue with. These guys work very hard. They should be. But when he started to struggle and the team needed him and he was struggling, not a peep. It is interesting. And I don't know, you square that with like Jamison Tyone, who would go in the post games or social media or whatever and take accountability for every little thing. And I'm not saying that Marcus didn't, but I just mean on social media. He was very loud on social media when he was pitching well silent crickets when he I was get pitching it. poorly it just rubs me the wrong way i all. get it i, I get don't it. know if that speaks to how it is in the clubhouse things like that that's where i was going to i i just it, it's one of those things that stuck out to me as like yeah I, I don't think i i don't think i love this like as a guy who's supposed to be a veteran a leader you got a lot of young pitchers on this team like i don't know that i I'm not in the clubhouse. I don't know him, of course, so I don't want to speak out of turn. But I, I didn't like that. If you want to be at the front when things are going well and be a, a team leader, you have to be at the front when it's going poorly. Davey spoke a lot toward the end of the year about how poorly he was hitting down the stretch. It was very frustrating for a lot of fans. Some, I think, were taking it too far in like kind of forgetting who Dansby Swanson is and the player they signed, but he was accountable for it. He said over and over and over again, I was not good enough. I didn't hit well enough. I let the team down. I needed to be better. Blah, blah, blah. He said it all the time. That's all. That's all I'm saying. I get it. If he, if the clubhouse is fine with him and the front office trust him as a reliable player, like I have no problem with it. There's a huge degree of uh, gray area and why you went off social media. I get all of that. But if his teammates are fine with it, if he's involved in the community, if the front office is fine with it, then like I'm, I'm fine with it. It's some sometimes as it, fans, I don't think it would be a bad move from a team perspective. I just yeah. had hoped that they could do better. That's all. I, man, it's it's it, this is our reality of where we're at. That's it's the I unfortunate truth. Reality, and I substitute my own. 
All right. Well, you can go on YouTube and watch those 2016 John Lester highlights. Yeah. yeah, you can you, uh, you can go uh, watch those home runs he hits, lefty yeah. home runs, That's even in spring really training. The, the 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 real realization that has crept in is, you know, big bad Johnny it, Lester's God. just not walking through that door to save this team. He's just not. I'm not. I'm not gonna lie. I did one of my first reactions when David Ross was fired. I'm like, oh. We may see less of John Lester now because Ross too. is not. Th- you thought that I, too? I did wonder if he was like, <laughs> yeah. that was messed up. I'm sure he did. Know. I'm sure John I'm sure was he... in a deer stand. He doesn't care. I don't he understand does. the whole, I don't understand John and the deer stand. He grew up in Washington, didn't he? I think rural Washington. Is that what it is? Okay. I thought he was like more like urban. I mean, he, if he didn't know where he was born, I, and again, I don't know the ins and outs of the state of Washington, but. Yeah, if going. he didn't know anything about where he was born, he'd be like, "This is a country boy." Like, I thought like maybe he and Dansby Swanson would like enjoy like a cabin weekend or something like that. But Dansby seems more urban than even John Lester, and, and Dansby's a Atlanta Georgia kid. Interesting. Yeah, I don't Dansby, know. Dansby, Dansby feels like a red wine kind of guy. John Lester does slam and Miller lights. <laughs> he does. Yeah. <laughs> well, Dansby bought Theo's mansion in Wrigleyville. He definitely he has like bougie taste. You can definitely tell. You can definitely tell, but well, listen. I mean, when you're when you and your wife are like stars in, in you know star athletes in the same city, you got to be living it up. I think there's no you know you've earned it. There's, yeah, absolutely. You're a power couple. Yeah, you have to. Absolutely. Anyway, that's where I'm at, man. I mean, like I to wrap up my thoughts. I think you personally set yourself up for this feeling, Corey. I will say that you did. I warned. I warned you with Otani. I warned you with everything. I've been saying this is a very ambitious you warned off season. Me on Otani, but you eventually got pulled in. Don't lie I, about that. Yeah, I did for like three days, yeah, yeah. but it was only it was only three days. I always get pulled in at the very last and second. What a three days! <laughs> <laughs> what a three days it was. Man. But it was only Boy, three that days. Dream was so fun. Oh wow, yeah. it really was. But in uh, my head, the Cubs teams with like Bryce Harper and Shohei Otani, they're really cool. You guys, did so. you? I mean. Did you buy in a Harper? I don't remember what your thoughts were with that. I don't remember you being like boisterous with it. I don't really remember. We'd have yeah. to go back and listen to those episodes, and I don't like to listen to myself talk. So the problem during that era where you and I differed, I was in denial the entire time. Uh, the 2018 that collapsed, denial. 2019, Joe Madden getting let go, complete denial. And then 2020 to 2023 has been one big blur. Like I, so it's right. it's. I've been trying to rebound ever since 2019, to be quite honest with you. I don't know. I don't know, man. I don't know. Ultimately, but- I we'll see what happens, right? I think there's a there's there's plenty of time left. There's plenty of players available. There's routes to get to. I, I'm going to hold myself to the standard that I'm not going to move my own goalpost. I said I wanted this team to be the favorite in the National League Central. I did not say I expected them to get to the level of the Braves and Dodgers or be a prohibitive World Series favorite or anything like that. What I asked for was to be the the absolute best team on paper, because until they play, that's all you have, in their own division. So yeah. they're not dealing with a five-team chase for the wild card in the last two weeks win the division and be the favorite to win the division. And that will be a good enough off season for me. And I believe they can still get there. I don't, I don't believe it. I know it. I don't know that they will, but in terms of the paths available to them, absolutely. It, it is, it is possible for them to do that. But squaring that with the, it's, it just, it's a, it's another year. It's another off season where the Chicago Cubs for as great as they are in in so many respects, are not going to act like and position themselves as one of the top-tier organizations in this league. They are just not in that class at this moment, and that is a bummer. You can't trade prospects for one-year guys, Corey. That's always the response that that is going to be thrown your way. But this is is what it is. for, For what? For like Juan Soto and all those guys and Glassbound and all that. I know. I'm, I'm poking fun at that. Relax over there. You're on high alert, I can tell. You're on edge over yeah. there. Relax. Go have a bottle of wine or something like that. Yeah. But this is this. Sunny side guy. You know that. You're a, I know you're a sunny side guy. But the, 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 
the optimism I have is get yourself in a competitive projection, 80-ish or so wins, and you see what happens. Turn on those games Friday at 1.20 p.m., Friday afternoon games. Dansby takes the field with Nico side-by-side, Justice Steele out there on the mound, Adber Alzali in the late inning uh, leverage, the Asaya performing, like second half Asaya, Hap is doing his stuff. You know, Cubs will be here in three, four months. We'll be watching 162 games. And you know what? They're probably going to be interesting. And I'm fine with that. My expectation was stupid. I thought, really, there was a path forward to win 94-plus games on paper going into this season, offseason. I thought Juan Soto was a realistic opportunity. Not the case. I thought Juan Soto, Tyler Glasnow, Yamamoto, I bought into all of these guys, Pillow it with Reese Hoskins, if you will, or Cody Bellinger. I thought that was like actually on the table. Uh, but in my mind, that was the only path forward to being an obvious contender next year. And the moment Soto was gone, I knew it was probably not likely. And as a result, my perspective now, has changed. You're a bootlicker. I guess I am. Yeah. I guess I am. You know, it is what it is. You are what Tom and Crane dream of. Oh, I'm like... You, people that when like, Tom yeah. goes into a board meeting, he shows a picture of my face and is like, this is our base. We will never lose these guys. How yeah, do we get the other fans? I, yeah, the, the only thing though is like the idea that it's not, obviously I'm joking. The idea that it's not me is hilarious. It's me. <laughs> Well, it's you and me side I by side. this and I'm a season ticket holder. So like, <laughs> yeah. they, and they know that. They, they know that, I, like, I don't even know what they would have to do for me to get rid of them. You're sucked in forever as you sit there with a uh, 1.20 p.m. clock hat on in your Wrigleyville area. <laughs> You're a sick person. This team could win 60 games. You'll still be going to these games. No, I did go to a lot less in 2022. What's a lot less? Like 10? Less than 10? I, I, I don't know. There were a lot of those games I did not go to, though. Okay. Well, you watch a lot of them. Like those that week, I know. Those week night. I mean, I, now I'm, like, trying to recenter myself on who was even, like, who was even on that team. Cause Rafael all, Ortega, Frank Schwindel. Yeah, I was like, listen, I'm not I'm not going to the game. It's it's 45 degrees. I'm not watching this. Like, no, I can't do that. I can't do that now. I will feel better when they take the field and I have a hot dog. Fair enough. And an ice cold Goose Island. Fair enough. But until then, until Jed signs someone, <laughs> it be wildly uncomfortable. All, All right. right. <laughs> That's it. That's what we have for you. Uh, maybe maybe Brendan and I will make a Patreon where we just sit on Twitch all night and just don't stop talking. Nah, I would black out drunk, I think, if I did that. It's I feel before. like maybe there's like a... Uh, we, we could like piggyback off of the uh blogathon that brett does at, at bleacher nation where he blogs for 24 straight hours but we just stay you and i talking to each other for 24 hours for charity could we do that like could we actually talk for 24 straight hours i'm already could. losing my I voice right now we could oh we probably could we probably could <laughs> like, i wouldn't having it be right now is tough because like it, it, there there's no new moves or like that but if like they were playing games absolutely no absolutely. no doubt no, 24 no. hours is crazy, but like, yeah, we could. I'm sure we yeah. could. Yeah, that'd be kind of funny, actually. <laughs> get Cody pop in there, right, for a few. Oh, boy. He, we, he, we, we'd, we'd get through it, I think. Get uh, 5.30 a.m. Luke Stuckmeyer waking up. Right. Good morning. Yeah, bags underneath doing? his eyes. <laughs> yeah. And hilarious. I can see that being really funny. He logs in. He's half asleep. He's like, hey, so what are you guys talking about? And you and I are like screaming at each other. Oh, my God. I got like three anyway. shirts up. We got to go. Uh, that is all we have for you. As always, the CHGO Cubs crew will be here. We were at the CHGO company holiday party last week. I was week not. As the Otani Blue Jays stuff, the flight tracking and all of that was really going down. We were so ready to move the party, which was in our office where the studios are yeah. and say, Hey, you, y'all have to either leave or be quiet because the Cubs crew that was there, which I think was just me and Jared and Ryan. Yeah. were 
we're, we we got to do a breaking news show. We were ready. Didn't happen. Would have been. Fun. Well, I saw you on the uh, Bulls show. Yeah, popped on the set. I did. Yeah, the whole crew. That. I'm not gonna. I was pretty jealous. I felt left out. I really. I was there uh, literally. Listen, it, it, obviously, we're we're all about building community here, but it is a really great team. Um, and yeah, wow. appreciate. Uh, Wow. Big Dave, Will, wow. and Matt Peck for allowing the entire company to parade in during one of the. I, I love how you cu- I love how you cut me off, and I'm about to say I I wish I could be there, and you said yeah, you know what, we have a great community, and you just cut me off. You didn't even say yeah, I wish you were there too, man. I, yeah, you could you know? fly. I don't believe you. You could fly to Chicago whenever you wanted. You just don't. That's not true. If whatsoever. they wanted to, they would. Brendan. That's not true, true whatsoever. True in podcast. Hopefully. It's interesting how, you know, I've gone to Chicago twice in the past like six months and like you're out of town the first time. The entire studio is in, I guess, Nashville for some meeting conference or something like that. Like yeah. It's, you know, a lot of people do like me, believe it or not. I know it's a very surprising th- uh, thing to think, but believe it or not, they do. Sure. Uh, but I am going to cut you off again because you and I are breaking one of our cardinal rules, which is not talking about the Cubs. All right, that's true. Uh, so this is where we are going to bid you farewell. Cody, Luke, Ryan, we'll be back with you on Monday, of course, unless there is an emergency over the weekend, in which case some version of this team will assemble and be live as quickly as possible to break it all down. I believe Luke and Ryan did an emergency show even after Shohei Osani, Otani signed with somebody else. So we're. I was on that show. Thanks for listening, dude. Yeah. See, I listen to you all the time. <laughs> I listen to you all the time. I'm on the show for an hour talking listening. about Look, it. Look, I support our own company, but I'm not watching a show to talk about Shohei Otani signing with the Dodgers. Jeez. Wow. Talk about kicking a man when he's down. I gotta you're watch kicking, a you're kicking me. About I'm like dying over here. You're just kicking my head, but that's okay. Keep going. Yeah. Give your sign off. It is what it is. I have to give. I have to give the uh, Jeez, Brendan man. Hive ammunition. Uh, they're they're going to come after you. They really are. Anyway, Brendan and I will talk to you again next Friday. I de- listen, guys, desperately. <laughs> Can we raise the, the bar at this point? Is Jorge Alfaro, who we didn't even really talk about because you guys don't want to hear us talk about depth catching? I'm sure of it. If you did want to hear us talk about depth catching, leave a comment on YouTube. We'll check those out. And I apologize for neglecting uh, the subject. But He's got a good arm, actually. I said that. So okay. we did discuss what everyone needs to know. So that's okay. it. <laughs> he has some pop, too. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, we appreciate you guys tuning in. We appreciate you guys indulging Brendan and I rambling on for 90 minutes just to get through this off season together. And I hope come next week, we've done an emergency podcast. We have some exciting news and some, some new players to talk about or some new old players, whatever it may be, better players than they currently have right now. That's Bring back uh, Jake Arrieta. Not again. Okay. The third time's the charm. Yeah, why not? But anyway, we appreciate you guys tuning in. Appreciate your support for – CHGO and the CHGO Cubs podcast. We will talk to you again soon. And as always, go Cubs. We all silly like the